I'm going to try and give you the shortcut and the, the cheats way to do this stuff on mobile. I <coughs> okay. I how many iOS developers do we have? All oh, right, cool, quite a few. Okay, more than I expected. That's great. Okay, so I'm curious, how many of you have watched the the TV show Silicon Valley? Almost everyone, yeah. So this is probably like one of the, f the most famous episodes of the hot dog, not hot dog. Everyone knows what I'm talking about when we're talking about this, yes? OK, so I'm going to teach you how to do this. But rather than do hot dog, not hot dog, we're going to do satay, not satay. <laughs> All right. So what was the call out? So, uh, so basically what I've done, and I'm just going to go through this reasonably quickly, so don't worry, we're not going to go too late or anything. I'm going to show you how you would sort of take something like this, and if you were given sort of like one night to do it, or you're given a really short time to do it, how would you approach this problem? So the first thing is the data set. I, so the data set that I started out with, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the, like, sort of the challenges that I had doing this as well. So the data set I started out with was, was 2,000 images of satay pictures. I, if you're ever having to, I realize one of the things I didn't put in here, if you ever have to download a whole bunch of images very quickly from the web, there's a very cool Chrome extension called FATKUN, F-A-T-K-U-N, which allows you to bulk download a whole bunch of images uh, of course, you will check that you have the copyright to use those images, first of all. <laughs> um, the biggest challenge with this, though, is what is not satay, right? And this is, uh, this is also the challenge that the guys who built the HBO model for the hot dog, not hot dog also had, right? Is how do you define sort of like classifying a negative to say, some, you know, that, okay, this is what satay is, that's pretty easy. Well, it's not satay. So I took 2,500 images, mostly other foods, but we threw in a bunch of other sort of weird random things as well. If I was doing it more, I'd probably increase this a lot more uh, and put even more sort of out there images. And I'll talk about some of the results maybe later on. I, one of the big things you've got to do, though, is you know, train it with basic image augmentation. So. We, I realize we haven't really talked about this a lot. Obviously, the more advanced people will understand what image augmentation is. I, image augmentation, especially in Keras, is very easy to do. You just use an image data generator. And basically, you tell it that each time you load these images, I want you to sort of randomly rotate them, randomly rescale them, randomly zoom in a bit, randomly image flip it, maybe so that you know, if something was on the left, now it's on the right, that kind of thing. I, this allows you to take that, that small data set of 2,000 images and really you know, turn it into a lot more images. And you're basically just sampling from that data set, running it through the image augmentation, uh, and changing it. So you can actually sort of define how big your, uh, you know, how many batches you want to do of something like that. So the models. So both uh, Martin and Andrea have talked a lot about models. I'm not going to harp on about this that much. I, obviously, for mobile, the smaller the better. It's all about the number of, of parameters in your models. Uh, but then sometimes you find that it's even more than that. Hence, you know, the weight rounding, quantization, all these other things that you can use to improve. I, so I, I took these models. I, and one of the reasons why I took these models is that all of these models are available as sort of off-the-shelf models in Keras that you can basically go into keras.applications and load one of these models trained with ImageNet. And then basically just cut off the top and re retrain it for your, you know, whatever you're trying to classify. This is some of the sort of feedback, or this is some of the, the, you know, the results that I got with this. Um, a lot of the models don't turn out to be the size of what they should be. Even you saw in Andrea's thing that his squeeze net was, you know, 12.7 meg, uh, and Martin told you that in the academic paper it's only like 500k, and you can see my one was like 5.6 meg. 
things change, right? When you get out there in the real world, you find that sort of you need to be flexible. One of the really weird things here, though, is VGG16, which should be, if you download the image net weights to it, it's about 550 meg, and it's come out at only uh, 110 meg. I, now, you can see I've put the, the keras size is basically when you save, save the model. The parameters is the number of parameters. I'll walk, do a walkthrough in a minute. You'll see some of these things. And then what we're going to be using is CoreML, which is Apple's new uh, iOS 11 uh, thing. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And then also, Apple also made some pre-made some models that are using this. And those pre-made models weren't made, I'm almost 100% certain they weren't made in Keras. They were most likely made in Cafe. Right, but you can sort of see how the sizes compare. So let me just show you really quickly a walkthrough. So the whole idea here is just to do basic, you know, the whole idea here, oh, I need to zoom in. How's that? Better? All right, the whole idea is here is that we're basically just using transfer learning. So we're using everything that ImageNet has been you know, trained on to extract features from images. Uh, and we're generally just looking to re retrain the last few layers. So you can see that here, uh, I'm basically sort of defining where I'm getting the, the stuff. I'm defining uh, an input. And then basically, I'm just loading up, uh, in this case, VG16. But I did one of these for each of those five different models before. So in this case, VG16, I'm saying that I want the image net weights. I'm saying that I don't want the uh, the t you know the sort of last few layers of the network, the top of the network, I and then I just run through those layers and set trainable to be false. So meaning that I don't want to have to retrain all the convolutions. I'm just going to use whatever the convolutions were set for ImageNet, and I'm just going to retrain the last few layers. Martin's talked about this before in depth when we've talked about transfer learning. Um, okay, so in Keras we can do a very quick summary. To see the model here, we can see our total params. I, then I chuck on the other layers. So basically just take the output of that VGG, flatten it, add some dense layers, occasionally add a dropout. Uh, dropout could be left out here too. I, and then just run it through a softmax, and I'm doing it just down to uh, two classes, right? Sate, not sate. That's all, all I'm caring about here. So obviously, in ImageNet, this would be 1,000 classes. I, I, was a bit <laughs> I was a bit disturbed to see on the Apple, uh, the Apple forums where people were talking about how to do this that a lot of people seem to think that if you're retraining ImageNet and you want to classify Sate not Sate or something along those lines, that you should have 1,002 classes. doesn't work like that, right? <laughs> All right, we're just trying to class, classify two things. We have two classes. Uh, OK, so now there's the summary of the whole thing. I, and here's you can see that here's my code for the image augmentation. Basically, I'm just defining an image generator. I'm setting uh, you know, the rescaling of it. So I'm basically changing it I, you know, from being 0 to 255 to being 0 to 1. I, I've got some zoom there. I've got some horizontal flip. I, I set up two generators, one for the training, one for the validation. And then I basically just do a simple model.fit. All this stuff is very basic. I think, you know, unless you, if, if you're brand new, you know, if, if you're a beginner, then this is great stuff to learn, right? I'm guessing for most of the people here, we've gone through things like this before. But I want you to see that even with really basic stuff, you can get pretty decent results. So then all I do was basically save that out. I, and I just save that as a Keras model. Back to my slides. Now the cool thing I the cool thing with this is with the Core ML tools is it has the ability to read a Keras model and transform it from being a Keras model to being a Core ML model. So Core ML is Apple's new uh, wonderful sort of machine learning system, right? Uh, it, it runs on, or it has the ability to run on metal, so it means it can be sort of GPU optimized, it can be improved in, in a whole ways, you know, that's all done behind the scenes, you don't need to worry about any of that stuff. But, okay, to set it up, 
so there's two sort of parts to Core ML when you hear people talk about Core ML. Core ML is actually the SDK that's running on the phone, right? Core ML tools is a Python package that we use to convert from cafe models or Keras models in this case to that Apple format that we're going to then put on the phone. So to set this up, it's really simple. The one thing that sucks about it is that it has to be Python 2.7. Unfortunately, they, they're not, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, and there's a few things that are sort of limiting with it. OK, it also needs to be TensorFlow. At the moment, it's still just on TensorFlow 1.1. I imagine that will be updated over time. Uh, don't forget iOS 11 is still in beta. So I'm sure these things will be updated over time. And also, they recommend Keras, sort of the highest version of Keras is 2.04. At the moment, we've got 2.06 out. I found most of the time when I used 2.06, I had no problems, but occasionally I did. All right. The problem, though, is if you train the model in 2.06 on one model, then it doesn't load very well in 2.04 on, you know, on a different machine or even on the same machine. Um, OK, to install it, very simple. Pip install Core ML tools, right? I will, I will sort of go through and show you what you do. Now, here's the thing. When, when you're basically defining a, a model to convert, you kind of have to define basically the inputs of what's the input to this model, what are the outputs. And this is very similar to what Andrea sort of talked about. You know, are your outputs a classifier with two classes? Uh, are you, is your output going to be I, so some of you have seen me do like the super resolution models. If I was doing something like that, you would be outputting uh, a multi-dimensional array rather than actual classification. I, the other thing too is that you've got then settings things like is BGR, so is your model, you know, the, the order of the layers, uh, red, green, blue, or blue and green, red. Uh, different, different models use different orders. And you also have like color biases. And this is, the color biases is exactly what Andrea was showing you in C++ that with models like VGG16 or you know, certain models, you will subtract the mean before you put it in. And so with your color biases, you would basically say that the color bias for red is whatever the subtraction is going to be. Uh, very, very simple thing to do, a very simple thing to look up. So let's look at it in, in Jupyter. So, this is really simple. You basically just import uh, Core ML and Keras. You don't, actually, I didn't even need to, to import TensorFlow. I just basically imported the TensorFlow to show you that I'm using uh, what version of TensorFlow I'm using and stuff. I, you then basically just load the model as if it's in Keras. So the only thing that you need to import from Keras is load model, right? You don't need really anything else from that. I, but you basically just load the model. I, you can see here's the same model. It might actually maybe a different model that I've loaded here. I, but you can see this, the same sort of summary of, of loading a model into memory, and we're going to use that. Then to convert it, all we do is we have this one line, and we basically just say coreml tools.converters.keras.convert. And we basically put it in uh, our model, our input names. I, and then our outputs are going to be the, the classes. I, and you can see there I've got the class labels also named there. And what it does is it goes through and it then basically converts all that Keras stuff to Core ML tools. So you'll see back earlier on when I showed you the, the list of different models, two of the models weren't working. So SqueezeNet at the moment wasn't working. And also, uh, the mobile net model wasn't working, mostly because they're using things that are, are maybe a little bit unusual uh, in Keras. And Apple hasn't written the way Core ML Tools works is it knows how a certain Keras layer is, and it then writes the conversion for that layer. So anything that's sort of like a custom layer, it will then often have problems with. Uh, things like mobile mobile nets model uses um, depthwise convolutions, so that. Uh, at the moment is not supported. I suspect, though, over time you will see more of these things be su supported. I, it seems that Apple, for whatever reason, has preferred to support CAFE a lot more uh, at, at the moment. So it seems to have more things supported, but I suspect later on they will come. You can even go in and write your own ones if you want to all right, for that. Um, also, I suspect in the future we'll start to see native TensorFlow you know, support for this as well. Uh, 
the challenge is they just need to write it all. So okay, once we've converted our model, here's, here's the, the sole line of code that we use to basically convert the model. Then we basically add some metadata to it, uh, and then we can actually see what the model is. So we can see that this is, this is what the model you know, has put together. I, now, if you're running the, the latest version of iOS, which is still, so, sorry, of um, OS X, which is still in beta, you could actually make predictions from the Corel model in your Mac to test it. So unfortunately, I'm, I'm running 10.12, not 10.13 beta, but so it would throw an error at the moment. But if, if we had that in, and obviously when that comes out, you'll be able to just use these lines of code to actually then load a picture in and make a prediction on it and see, OK, is it doing what I think it's doing? You know, I, especially at the start, you're going to find you know, something like sate not sate. You may have got the class's order wrong or something, because Keras is doing all that automatically. And you might find it flipped. So you need to sort of check that out. And then basically, we just save the model. I, and this is, this is all I do to save the model. So now bringing that model into, I, into Xcode and iOS um, couldn't be easier. All you literally do is you take that exported model and drag it in uh, to your Xcode project. Uh, you add it to your build, which would be on the right here. I haven't shown that, but you add it to your build. And then basically you'll see that this is, when you click on it, this is what you should see. It, it's giving you uh, all that, that metadata that we had before. It's also, um, what it's done is it's made an interface file for this. And it can make the interface file in, in both Swift and Objective-C. Objective -C. And it shows us here now what our image, what our input needs to be. So we can see that it basically needs to be an image file, RGB, 229 pixels by 229 pixels. And it's going to return a dictionary and a class label. Now, to put that in, to, to use that in your app, all you have to do is basically instantiate the model. So you can see, oh, I can't really mouse over, but you can see here that I'm basically just instantiating the model. Uh, if you see the line, uh, you know, let model equals try VN core ML model. And then basically you can see there, all I've got is just sate01 dot model. That's the whole sort of code for instantiating your model. I, and then I basically add a completion handler so that after I've passed an image in, I've got something to handle the response that gets back. And that response is going to be like this. So if you look at this code, it's, you know, it's, this is very sort of simple code that's basically saying, OK, if the classification is less than 97%, say that it's not sate. Right? Because it tends to get more things wrong in that direction than in the other direction. Uh, and then I've also got some, some code in here. So I figured, OK, if you're going this way, you might as well get Siri to read it out for you and tell you whether you actually got sate or not sate. So you can see uh, down the bottom, I've got synthesized speech from string and basically just passing in the complete sentence uh, that I've allocated there. And you end up with something like this. So do we have audio? This looks like a satay, and I'm 100% sure. Yeah, I think it's not satay. This looks like a satay, and I'm 100% sure. It's not satay. It's not satay. This looks like a satay, and I'm 100% sure. OK. So I said that, that you were doing it. Uh, what were you using to do it live? Because I was trying to work that out. Uh, just, it's just QuickTime does it now. I forgot all about that. I used to have Reflector installed. But anyway, um, I, it's, so th this is, I want you to see that how simple this could be, right? to just build an app like that. It's not perfect. You know, the amount of data that it's been trained on, uh, it's very good at spotting the sticks of Sate. So anything that sort of looks like a stick, it will sort of you know, jump onto that as, oh, yeah, OK, that's Sate. Um, but the, the, where, the, where the, probably the model is flawed is if, if anything has too much fine detail that's straight, 
in an image, it then may confuse those for being the sticks as well. I, but I, I wanted you to sort of see that like I, where this is going, and I think this is not just with, uh, not just with iOS, I think you're going to start seeing things like this with Android as well, where a lot of these things are going to get easier and easier to do some of the things. Now, uh, certainly what Andrea was doing with you know, more advanced stuff, uh, with the object detection or anything that you wanted to do that was maybe more advanced, you are going to need to sort of go down to C++, C++ at some stage. But to do a lot of these sort of simple things, you could build a classifier and stick it in an app, and you're looking at sort of like, you know, excluding training time, a few hours work. So to sort of sum it up, I would say that, you know, uh, Corimel makes getting a model on iOS very quick, very, very quick. Uh, and I think it's going to get better uh, over time, meaning that we, we're going to be able to convert things from Keras from TensorFlow easier over time. It is still rather limited in what you can do with it. I, there will always be cases where you're going to need, especially if you want really small models or you want things that are really um, optimized, you're definitely better to go sort of Andrea's way. Uh, this, uh, the cool thing with this, though, is that this is all being you, done on um, the Metal 2 framework. So it's actually using the GPU in your, in your iPhone. And I think we're going to see uh, one of the things that Martin talked about, you know, I think we're going to see in the next generation iPhones that we're going to see much more powerful sort of GPUs coming. And it's certainly happening with uh, Qualcomm's chipset and, you know, some of the other chipsets for Android and stuff as well. I, we can see that this is the direction to go. And more and more, I, if you don't have to, there's no point in pushing something to the cloud to be classified. If you can do it on the phone, you're going to get it much quicker. It's not going to cost the person you know, much in bandwidth, all those sorts of things. That, you know, more and more, we're moving things to the edge sort of case. Um, like I said before, I think TensorFlow support probably will come. Uh, Apple's kind of hinted at it a few times, but hasn't sort of announced anything. Uh, the other thing I would say is that last weekend, uh, or last week, TensorFlow 1.3 dropped. I, that also has some cool new things for using in iOS with CocoaPods and being able to import stuff with that. So and, um, I've put up on GitHub the full source code to the, the app, Sate Not Sate. I, and I'll also put up the, the Keras and the Core ML stuff later on. And also I've put up a really cool, uh, here I've put up a link to uh, a, a Medium article, there's really good article that was written by the guy who actually made the hot dog, not hot dog one. And they spent like three months doing it or something and tried all the different models and all the different ways of doing it. Um, interestingly, in the end, they built it with um, React Native. It's not built in, in you know, uh, in native, it's not sort of like, you know, iOS native or anything like that. I, that's it. Any questions? All right. Oh, everyone just wants to run. <laughs> okay. Uh, you said it's a few hours worth to what kind of uh, how do you enable it? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so, okay, so, okay. Good point. Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, how do I label the images? I didn't need to label the images because by using the image data generator, I can just tell it that each folder is one label. So I literally just have one folder called Sate Images, chucked all the Sate Images in there, had one folder called Not Sate Images, chucked all the other images in there. Uh, just downloading them, right? Sorry? Yeah, that could be one way you could do it. <laughs> yeah, you're trusting Google. You know, I, that, that extension that I mentioned I really helps you to be able to just highlight all the images and just click download. And then that load the next page, click, you know, it, in fact, it'll automatically highlight all the images and you just click the ones that you don't want. So you can sit there very quickly, you can get, you know, a, a thousand images quite quickly. <laughs> all right, so this is, you know, a good way for sort of hacking labeling data.
And it, and it is a really interesting case too, because technically I'm not using any of those images, right? So have I violated the copyright of those images or not? I, no one, that, that, you know, that's, of course I wouldn't have done that though. <laughs> any other questions? Oh, so well, the problem is with not a class is that includes everything, right? So you, so I kind of in the end decided, okay, let's just go for most people will compare this to one form of food and satay, right? So I went for for sort of most of the 2,500 images were just 2,000 images of different types of food. I one of the problems that I had at the start, I was that. I, is that, so I got one of my staff to actually download those, those 2,000 images, and she had actually downloaded a lot of images from recipe sites. The problem with images from recipe sites is they have, often have text in the image, right, which then sort of started to throw the model, that the model was clearly starting to look for text. And I'm sure if I had an image of satay and it was, had big words satay, it would suddenly decide, oh no, that's not satay because there's text there. All right, so you want to be very sort of aware of things like that and look at your, the distribution of your data set and see, okay, well, what's, what's common here, what's not common here? All right. And so by, doing, by basically just going through and culling out the ones with, with text and sort of putting in some new ones, I, that fixed the problem straight away. Uh, very, very, very quickly. In some ways, it's a class imbalance, but the problem, yeah, so the question was is this like a class imbalance? Um, you were touching with 97, you actually really sort of have that proper static image. Yes, right? So by going for the 97% confidence, I, and that was partly because I didn't want anything that sort of like has a number of lines that look like the sticks to throw the model. So I basically just started doing it. And actually, it's, it's only every now and then that it will throw. But it, it will be weird, really weird. Like, uh, I was showing it to Andrea earlier on, right? And when I took a picture of something like this, it was fine. But then when we took a picture out that way, where there were lots of details in the image, it said, oh, it's saute, right? I, so yeah, you, you want to be sort of like uh, aware of that. The cool thing with the way of training with these I image data generators though, is you're just constantly sampling batches from those two things. So it, it's not like, so the, the, the model will, will actually see uh, a certain, certain number of SATE images and the equivalent number of not SATE images in that sense. It, you know, it's randomly sort of doing it. If you saw, you can use the similar, sort of, the similar sort of technique I did last time with pseudo labeling, was trying to do that where I was trying to sort of trick the model by, by making sure that I had 75% from something that I knew was right and 25% from something that I knew was maybe not 100% right. I, but it, it is a little bit of a, a class imbalance, but because you're sampling from them both and it's just random, you're not actually going through every single image in a row kind of thing. I, it, it works out. Now, ideally, if I was trying to make a, you know, a production model app like this, I would definitely want a, a lot more images for both sate and for not sate. And I would constantly just be, you know, I'd certainly also train a, a lot more. These, these ones I trained, uh, after about 10 epochs, it was getting very good results. Uh, after 20 epochs, it was, you know, it was probably sort of like 95% accurate. So I figured, okay, yeah, that, that's enough. Okay, so so in something like that, yes, you would need to sort of work out, you know, an example of frames with that. You would also use probably either image, you know, object detection for that, which would be a little bit different, or I may even use something like um, segmentation for that. So you know, a segmentation model. That's so all the sort of self-driving car stuff is using segmentation models, not classification models. <laughs>
Any other questions? No? That's it. So Martin, you know, uh, <coughs> Martin mentioned earlier on about, about this. Uh, if you've got any questions or something like that, you know, please feel free to come and uh, come and ask us. I I think most of the spots we sent everyone who sort of signed up already, like signed up showing interest, we sent it out already. Most of the spots are already sort of gone. I I think yeah, Martin's already covered most of the sort of stuff. The big thing that with this though is that I would say is that it's very much a balance between theory and implementation. So everything that we teach you in theory, we expect you to be able to build. In fact, we will get you to build your own model of doing that sort of stuff. But anyway, that's it. Thank you for coming.